Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. First of all, thank you for your kind introduction and uh, thank you very much University Malaya for having me here today. So, um, I'll maybe uh, share a little bit um, uh, about the future of e-learning in Malaysian landscape. Uh, maybe most of the things that, um, that I share here has been very familiar to you, but I hope um, my sharing today can uh, add some um, additional information uh, to you. Uh, let me start by how education has evolved over the years. Maybe not entirely related to uh, e-learning, but in the 1920s, what we do is that uh, the way we teach is uh, often regarded as lecture-based. And then towards the 1990s, we have uh, internet with us. And um, at that time, we share um, in the form of text um, our knowledge through the internet. So this is a very plain web, uh, web page that uh, many of us can access to. And then in the early 2000s, we have uh, further evolved uh, towards a knowledge-based education landscape in which we, uh, we try to pay more attention to how to teach effectively with the presence of internet. So we have the uh, constructivism learning theory, we have um, how to game, uh, we learn how to gamify our teaching and learning. And currently I would say that uh, the way we teach is more towards demand based. So um, we try to take into consideration um, what our stakeholders want and our own, our learners also have their own preference on what they want to learn. So this is um, how um, education has changed over the time. And when I talk about demand-based education, um, it's, more, it's more or less uh, related to skill-based learning. So people want to know about how, how do I learn how to do CPR, for example. I want to know how do I learn to make technical moves, how, how do I manage business uh, more uh, efficiently, how do, I, uh, how do you teach someone micro spreading, and how to teach someone how they can learn better. So these are the things that, you know, they want to learn and then uh, it's very specific and very narrow uh, in which, um, you know, offering a very big program may not seem relevant anymore. Okay? And I frame this all together with e-learning um, in, in such a way that uh, we have to give our students um, and um, demand-based education and we cannot run away from the fact that to, to fit this demand-based education, we have to combine that with digital learning and we have to provide an immersive learning spaces. And based on this combination later on, uh, it will drive us towards having uh, learning styles that is very personalized. Uh, then we will have uh, education that is very tailor-made to individual needs of our students. So I think uh, one of our speakers will be talking about personalized learning later in the afternoon. And when I talk about immersive classroom um, or immersive learning spaces, this means that um, students are able to feel um, their presence in the computer-generated world. So this is how learning is like. And it's quite difficult to not be able to see my own slide. Okay. And um, when we want to design a demand-based education, we also have to pay attention to what they need to, to learn skill base, and that's why immersive learning spaces is very important. Because students, we should tell, we should be able to provide learning spaces in which students can decide what they want to do, how they want to do it, and when they want to do things in her own learning space. I give an example of this uh, interesting uh, article that I came across. Um, if you are familiar with uh, Second Life uh, environment, this is a very old, um, old environment uh, that uh, evolved in the early 2000s. So um, Second Life allows educators to create a simulated learning environment in which the students can interact virtually with the uh, educational content. And, uh, and I think in UTM, we did have uh, also implement this in um, Many of our ODL courses, we create environment um, to make uh, learning more fun for, the, for our ODL and distance students. 
So this environment allows um, students to interact uh, with genetic objects from simple experiment uh, to the organization of whole genome. So this is a very interesting example and it is based on drag and drop basis which is anyone can, um, can create this learning environment. And another immersive learning spaces or immersive learning that uh, we can came across is this one is reported by World Economic Forum which in which um, they created a t-shirt, a very nice t-shirt uh, that students can wear um, which allows them to explore inside the body via an augmented reality application. Uh, so this is also can be one of the interactive ways that our students can learn in immersive learning spaces. And I have to share, uh, in UTM, we have virtual lab UTM. This is um, a learning space for students to carry out experiments virtually. So we, uh, when we are developing ODL programs, we have this environment in which, for example, some of our ODL programs require students to do hands-on activities, hands-on related experiments. So we create this learning environment for them to be able to do this experiment. For example, I have a subject on organic chemistry and we have lab subject related to organic chemistry. So what we do is that we take the organic chemistry lab syllabus and then turn that into simulation, simulated environment and then we put it here so that the students can go through the organic chemistry lab activities in this virtual environment. So um, this is how we try to create, uh, to add values to our ODL program. So um, in such a way that um, hands-on activities should not be a limitation for ODL program developers. So you can, I think you can, uh, you can, um, you can go to the um, website, we are lab at It is still, we are still uh, coming up uh, with more um, lab, lab courses um, uh, for, our, for our students. And And that is immersive learning spaces. So another part of uh, providing demand-based education is digital learning. So not only we have um, immersive learning spaces, we also have to couple that with digital learning. And when we talk about digital learning, previously it starts with digitization. What we mean by dig digitization is that we take our textbook, we scan that, that is, you know, we have a digitized, uh, digitized learning content. Um, however, nowadays, um, it doesn't, doesn't really make sense anymore for you to digitize your content. You need to digitalize it. When we say about, when we talk about digitalization, it means that your learning content is interactive. Uh, you have, uh, uh, the way you present your content is more creative. And of course, it is supported by many other softwares that can allow this uh, digitalization of learning materials to happen. And we have many open software, for example, we have Camp Studio, we have um, Active Presenter in which you can create a sim in a very uh, seamless way, uh, in such a way that you can just drag and drop materials and then, then you have your learning, uh, learning content being developed. And um, to couple that with um, having create, creating a digitalized um, learning resources, you have to couple that with the way you teach in a digital learning environment as well. So, if you are familiar with connectivism learning theory, so this is a very specific learning theory to tell the educators that uh, how can you approach teaching and learning in such a way that our learners are currently learning in chaos. Learning in chaos means that, you know, you give students a learning environment in which they can click here and there, there are sounds coming from here and there. So that is learning in chaos. How can you manage uh, the students' learning environment in such a way that they can learn better uh, in the midst of all of this interactivity around them? Because um, mostly, most of, most of our um, uh, educators nowadays, what we tend to do is like, uh, we want to provide interactivity as much as we can, but sometimes we do not know how to limit ourselves towards this interactivity. So we have to know our limit um, in such a way that we have to understand that our students are learning in chaos. And connectivism learning theory tells educators that um, students are learning in network environment. So that means when you teach um, or when you design your learning environment, it doesn't make sense if you did not link that with external resources, for example. Because um, rather than having students accessing 
websites without your guidance, it is even better for you to guide your students, this is the correct material, I have verified this, I have read this one, and this is the correct references for your course, and for you to learn this better. So, um, educators have to understand it, uh, have to understand that students are learning in network environment, in which, without your, uh, whether you like it or not, they will obviously um, access to external website to understand more about certain concepts. But what we want to encourage among educators is that when you design your learning environment, provide this link, provide this network to your students because you are the content expert and you know which link or which resources matters to your students, matters to the course learning outcome. And then uh, Connectivism Learning Theory also tells us that uh, learning results in non-human appliances. This means that um, when we design our teaching and learning environment, we should also pay attention to cognitive load. What we mean by cognitive load is that you cannot, um, it is advisable that you do not give them more than they have to acquire. Because um, other than having this network environment in which they sometimes, when they read external resources, when they refer to external resources, they have the, they have the tendency to be absorbed in certain resources, certain external materials, in which they entirely forget the, the true things that matters in their course. So we have to also be aware when we want to design our learning environment to have this limitation to our students. And in Connectivism Learning Theory, it also tries to explain to educators that um, the capacity to know more is the capacity to know is more critical than what is currently known. This means that um, we have to instill in our students the concept of curiosity. So when you design your learning environment, you have to design that in such a way that students have the tendency to know more. So after they learn this one topic, uh, okay, I'm interested to know more. So what else? What else? And what's next? So this is how they say that uh, this will drive students to be self-directed learners. I think one of our speakers will talk about self-directed learning later on. So self-directed learners is very, uh, characteristic is very important, especially in ODL program. Because you are not there to tell them this is what you have to do because you are going to develop self-instructional materials in such a way that they can learn that learning content without you being around. So it's very important to create a, a learning environment that drives the student to want to click more links in your learning environment. So this is very important uh, on how you, as simple as write the instruction in your ODL courses or in your SIM, in such a way that they want to click more links in your courses. So this is what Connectivism Learning Theory explains uh, and advice to us on how teaching and learning should happen in a digital world. Previously, many of us might be familiar with connect Constructivism Learning Theory, uh, that is lear um, uh, learning happens when students construct knowledge or maybe uh, behaviorism learning theory, which uh, which means that learning happens when students are able to change their behavior towards the behavior that we want. So that no longer really applies in uh, a digital world in which um, learning um, occurs in in a, in a network environment. And on top of that, other than we have digital learning pedagogy on how can we teach best uh, in the digital world, we also have hybrid learning de delivery. Not only we have um, entirely online uh, delivery, we also have hybrid learning delivery, which also um, I'm going to show you, I think later on, uh, our recent uh, guidelines on hybrid learning. And for that, we also have, not only we have digital learning pedagogy, we have digital learning delivery, we also have digital learning content in the form of micro-credential, in the form of MOOCs, in the form of simple online courses, or at a bigger picture, we have uh, an online program, which is uh, in Malaysia, we call it as open and distance learning program. 
I think I have to highlight here, and I was asked to, to highlight about the difference between ODL and microcredential. So ODL means open and distance learning. It doesn't, doesn't have the word online anywhere in open in ODL. So why is this so? Because ODL was initially um, delivered by um, universities such as Open University Malaysia. So the way they carried out teaching and learning at that time using this ODL concept is that they have their learning materials via post. And anyone can learn through that materials. Okay? As I do, I do not but the other bigger post, I did, I did went through that kind of uh, tuition before. So that was the original concept of ODL. It doesn't mean online, but because of the interactivity and because of the affordable technology uh, in hand nowadays, so we expand that concept to having open and distance learning through internet. So that's why many institutions try to move away from having to post things up. So why not we just have that uh, program online? Uh, so this is a very uh, important concept and open and distant learning in Malaysian context means that it occurs at program level. So if you have, um, if you say that your program is, um, uh, you are teaching in ODL mode, that means we know that the way you have an ODL program uh, being registered uh, in, the MQ, in, in the MQR, and the mode of delivery is open and distance learning. So that is ODL at program level. However, in micro-credential, micro-credential means as in, as in, micro -credential is a small credential. So the word micro is small. The word um, credential is recognition of learning. So it doesn't mean that micro-credential has to be delivered online doesn't mean an online course. Micro-credential means that you give a credential to a small course, okay, based on certain CLO that we have achieved. So micro-credential in Malaysia, um, when you say that you have a micro-credential, that means you have a course that carries credential at the end of the learning. And this means when, when I didn't attach that to any of the word online, this means that micro-credential can be delivered online, face-to-face, -face, as well as hybrid mode. So you can offer your micro-credential course in a fully face-to-face -face mode. In UDM, you have that. We have a swimming course, okay, in the form of micro-credential because we offer that face-to-face. -face. So uh, it, it just means that at the end of the course, you will earn a credential which is micro, we call it micro because it doesn't lead you to um, um, having a degree in certain program. That's why it is called micro credential. So I hope that is clear. And other than that, okay, we have digital learning content, we have digital learning pedagogy, we have digital learning delivery. There are many other segments to educational technology. Uh, we have, for example, risk, um, um, which is increasingly becoming popular, which is uh, learning analytics. We have uh, AI tools in teaching and learning. We have Web 2.0 in teaching and learning. We have uh, collaboration tools in teaching and learning. So these are many other educational technology segments that is very re relevant to digital learning that can fit into the needs of our personalized learners in a demand-based education environment on top of having an immersive learning space. So when we have digital learning, we have immersive learning space that form the demand-based education. This will drive um, the need for personalized learning. So because our students nowadays, they know what they want and they know what they want to learn. So we have to design that environment that fit what they want and what they need. So personalized learning is basically um, considers the learners um, what the learners know before, which is prior learning. It combines um, what motivates them to learn, and it combines their belief about why I why this teaching and learning session matters to me. So it's very important for us to create a learning environment that fulfills the students' needs. And there are 
many ways on how we can promote and um, monitor our students so that their needs are being fulfilled and personalized to them. I'm going to show you an example here. If we have an ODL program later on, it's very important for us to monitor students' progress um, because we do not meet them like physically. So I do not know whether you're paying attention or not. Are you writing the things that you're supposed to write? Are you doing the activities that you're supposed to do? Uh, how, how do you manage to um, um, earn this um, um, uh, acquire this knowledge and how do I know you have been engaging in my course? So we have the, um, it's very important for institution to have a learning analytics dashboard. I hope this is being established uh, in, uh, in UM. Because learning analytics dashboard will allow us to engage our students better. So, because learning analytics dash dashboard will demonstrate to us, okay, these students is somehow lacking in this area because they did not follow, follow through certain materials that we have provided. And this is very important to have in our learning management system when we want to develop an ODL program. So, we are able to identify their behavior, their learning behavior, uh, whether it tailors with the things that they want to learn in the course through the analytics dashboard. I give you an example. This is a very this is an no. This is used to be an open source uh, plugins for learning management system. I think you can install that in Spectrum as well. We call it as Advisor Advisor Report. So it can uh, it allows uh, administration level to monitor as well as instructor level to monitor the time spent by the students in the course, um, what else? Yeah, visits, number of visits on site, how many percentage of completion that they have done with certain activities. And based on this analytics of behavior, we are able to understand how students learn, in fact, in, in the materials uh, that we have in our environment. So this is just, um, I put up here an example of um, my research on how, understanding how actually students construct their knowledge when they are learning online. So apparently, um, so I divided them into three, three, uh, three types of perform uh, performance. Number one is the high performing group who has um, highest um, highest performance in the course and then we have medium I call it a HL group and then we have low performing group so what I try to uh, analyze is that how high performers learn in online learning environment and how medium level students medium performer students learn in online learning environment and how low performer students learn in uh, online learning environment so we can have uh, a certain pattern for that and uh, apparently, student, high-performing students, they do all sorts of things in the online learning environment. On top of accessing, on top of accessing certain materials repeatedly, I also found out that when I give them, for example, formative quiz, this formative quiz is um, a quiz that I put at the end of every subtopic in my ODL course. Um, and I didn't tell them that it is compulsory for them to complete that quiz. And I told them that if you want to test what you have understand in that specific subtopic, feel free to take up this quiz. It's just a simple quiz related to concepts that consists of 5 to 10 questions. Sometimes if I have the time, then I put up up to 15 questions. But I told them that you can take up these questions repeatedly. So, for example, you know, when, when they do revision and they want to go back, I want to try again. Is, is this the correct thing that I understand about this concept? So, high-performing group carried out uh, these formative quizzes repeatedly. So, that they have a, a more complex interaction in the online learning environment compared to the uh, low-performing. And the most, um, I think, significant finding is that it's doing these quizzes uh, repeatedly because high performers, they tend to do this again and again. Although, as I said, it is not compulsory, it will not be part of your 
uh, carry marks in the course, but they have this tendency of uh, wanting to confirm what they have learned uh, individually in the course. And based on that understanding as well, we are able to predict who is at the risk of dropping out in the course. So um, this is our prediction, um, one of our prediction tools in our learning management system. We install that, especially for uh, to monitor students in ODL program, um, to prompt them whether they are at risk of dropping out in the course. It's very relevant to ODL students and not very relevant to our face-to-face -face students because um, our face-to-face -face students, the way they learn in our course depends on so many factors and we meet them in a face-to-face -face session. So it's not fair for us to judge them in terms of uh, they are at risk of dropping out from the, you know, based on the interaction in their online course only. But our ODL students, they learn entirely online, so it's quite fair to, um, to predict they are at risk of dropping out based on their interaction online. So this prediction will prompt both students and instructors in the course whether they are at risk of dropping out. At certain time frame, um, they will, um, and if the lecturer put up certain activities and they are not able to fulfill uh, the requirement, the system will prompt the students, hey, you should do these things and these are your current achievement. So, and if you are not able to do all this stuff, and then you are at the risk of dropping up. We use the indicator. This was the fundamentals of the, of the prediction. So, how the prediction is that if the students are not able to be socially present and cognitively present in the course, then they are at risk of dropping up. So we have the metrics, for example, if the um, activities that is related to social presence is based on this one. So this is, this is how they frame the prediction. Okay, for example, let's say the lecturer I think these tools are very familiar to you because we have the same learning platform, which is Moodle. So, for example, if the students, if the lecturer put up something related to online, external, external resources at the very corner there, that is when you put up external resources in your course, you will have that symbol. Okay? So that one carries the most marks for social breath. But very only one carry one point for cognitive depth. So based on the activities that the lecturers put up, based on these different tools in the LMS, they will give the system will give points. That's how it come up with the percentage just now. And if you uh, didn't meet the minimum percentage, and then the system will prompt you that you are at the risk of. Of course, the lecturers also have to, you know, make use of these tools. Uh, then only the system can uh, can make prediction. If the lecturers didn't put anything in their course, how can they do such prediction? Okay. So, for example, if you see here, uh, if we look at um, the second row, uh, we have uh, the halo symbol over there that carries two points for social breath, and that also carries two points for cognitive depth. That is, of course, provided that the lecturers put up the, the activity related to that symbol. So this is how um, we monitor how students learn. Uh, and actually, if we want to move a little bit more advanced, um, how can this assist personalized learning? Uh, we can always um, um, ask for students' preferences, what kind of activities that you prefer. And based on their engagement data, we are able to also tell what kind of activity that the students engage in the most. So that can also inform us on how can we design our learning environment better for our uh, students, for our online students. So, so as you see here, um, the recent 
um, version of Moodle have a little bit different um, of um, you know the the symbols. Um, so this um, creating scene later on will be explained by Professor Yusman can be as simple as having a very detailed instruction. It doesn't have to be very fancy, but what you need to pay attention to is that um, your instruction should be clear enough in such a way that your students that does not need you there to explain things to them. That is the most fundamental uh, things that you need to bear in mind when you design your self-instructional material. It has to be self-explained that your students does not need you. So it can be as simple as this, uh, or you can have more fancy things inside your online course. So that summarizes the concept that I think I have in mind, what happened and what might happen in the future of e-learning, in which nowadays we have demand-based education uh, that is a combination of immersive learning spaces and digital learning, which drives personalized uh, learning. And what happened in Malaysia, there are so many things that's happening. So this one, the first, I'm going to share a series of guidelines and policies available related to e-learning in Malaysia. So the first one we have, Dasar e Pembajaran Negara, this document is back in 2014. It talks about um, what higher education institution should achieve for online learning. So this was the very first document. The next one, I think in 2015, is e-learning guidelines for Malaysian uh, higher education institution. At that time, not many institutions has their own learning management system. So the ministry uh, made an initiative to have this guideline. So this guideline explain about what kind of infrastructure you should have if you want to have e-learning implementation, uh, impl implementation in your HEI, what kind of capacity building should you give to your staff when you want to have e-learning implementation? What kind of incentive, reward that you should uh, provide to your staff to promote e-learning uh, enculturation in your uh, university? So these are the things being talked about in the uh, e-learning guidelines for Malaysian higher education institution. <coughs> then we have Amalan Quality Book Malaysia. This is a guideline that talks about how can you have an online course with certain quality and when you want to offer that to anyone in the world. So that is the guideline, Amalan Quality Book Malaysia, which in which if you want to develop a micro-credential courses, micro-credential online courses specifically, you can also make use of this guideline because there's a series of checklists that you can use to check whether, okay, I have uh, I have filled in the course on outcome, I have stated uh, the assessment I have, um, uh, I have uploaded the certain uh, certain content and things like that. They have a list of checklists for you to follow if you want to develop an online course. Uh, and that online course can be micro credential, um, so you can make use of this guideline. Another guideline is on how to implement blended learning substitution. I think this is also very um, that it should be familiar among all, uh, among all of you. So this guideline talks about how can you substitute your face-to-face -face teaching and learning to online learning. How can you substitute that? That means you replace your face-to-face -face teaching and learning session with online learning session with certain percentage. And when you want to teach, when you want to replace your face-to-face -face session to online session, what should you do? And how can you manage the SLT for your online teaching and learning session? So, because now you have your course being blended, you have some part of it delivered online, you have some part of it delivered face-to-face. -face. So, you, because we might be familiar with how and what to do in face-to-face -face teaching, so this guideline teach you what should you do and how you manage your student learning time in the online teaching session, in a blended course. So that is the guideline. Next, we have this is quite recent. Garis Panduan Pelaksanaan Program Akademik Anjal. Okay, if you remember, uh, I think last year, um, there is an announcement in which uh, we want to encourage students to stay at home for certain years and then they can go back, they can continue part of, your, uh, part of their program in the university. So this is occurring at program level. 
Just now when we talk about blended learning, that occurs at course level. Now, how can we design uh, a blended learning program, a blended learning at program level? So this program academic Anjal talks about how institution or program owners can design their program to be a blended program. Part of it delivered online ke, part of it delivered at home ke, and part of it delivered uh, at a higher education institution. So this is the guideline. And then you have garis panduan pelaksanaan khusus pembelajaran hybrid. So how do you hybrid is different than blended pula. Okay, so this uh, garis panduan pelaksanaan pembelajaran hybrid, uh, it, it guides you on how can you deliver uh, your face-to-face uh, -face teaching and learning sessions in which there are also students available online at the same time. So this is the definition of hybrid learning in the course. Okay, so this, um, this uh, guideline uh, tells the higher education institution about how can you also set up infrastructure for hybrid learning classroom. Towards, uh, if you want to have a high-end hybrid learning classroom or uh, like a, to the low-end uh, hybrid learning classroom. So this uh, not only advises the higher education institution but it also gives guides to uh, course instructors on how to deliver um, like hybrid learning courses to deliver courses in hybrid okay? so it, that's different uh, with the blended learning now and this is the recent one which is I think um, was published last week I think it's on Garis Bantuan Technology Kecerdasan Buatan Generative Dalam Pengajaran dan Pembelajaran Pendidikan Tinggi so it generally talks about um, how you make use of generative AI in teaching and learning. Uh, it doesn't talk about AI in general. It talks very specific on generative AI uh, in teaching and learning. Uh, but um, I am not sure whether this is very useful for course owner because I think it is more useful for higher education institution because this guideline forces the higher education institution to have their own guideline on generative AI. Because a uh, higher education institution should have their own policy on how they take on the generative AI issues in research and publication, in teaching and learning. Um, if I may share, uh, UTM has their own um, uh, policy on generative AI as well. Uh, and generally, what we declare is that uh, generative AI in teaching and learning is encouraged. However, if a course instructor says that this course should not use generative AI, so the course instructor has to declare that to their students at the beginning of the course. So that when, for example, during assessment, if a student is found guilty of using generative AI without the proper guidelines, then we have a specific um, regulation, peraturan academic, to penalize the students. But this has to happen provided that the course instructor announce to their students, write that in the table or uh, table 4 or course information that you cannot use generative AI for this course. It has to be declared. Because, yeah, because we have um, uh, professors with many different mindsets about how to take on generative AI, so it has to be uh, friendly to everyone, uh, okay? So, but generally we encourage uh, and we promote the use of generative AI for teaching and learning, but if you uh, plan to uh, not use generative AI, you have to declare that in your course. So that is our take, our UTM takes on uh, generative AI in teaching and learning. There's more, okay, guidelines. Okay, this one is on guidelines to good practices uh, for micro credentials. So this guideline is uh, published by MQA. Uh, it generally talks about um, the statement of achievement, actually. What's important is the it's the last appendix of these guidelines. So it talks about uh, for higher education institution, if you plan to offer a micro-credential course to your student, what should be inside, um, what should be the statement that you issue to your student uh, at the end of uh, a micro-credential course? So it should cover like um, how many SLT that the, uh, the micro-credential carries is e or equivalent to what is the CLO, uh, how you assess your students, so um, that is what being guided in the um, guidelines uh, to good practices micro credentials. 
And according to MQA point of view about microcredential, as I said, they have the same perception that microcredential can be delivered either online, face to face, or in a hybrid mode. So you can offer uh, your microcredential courses in, in any of these modes. And they differentiate microcredentials into two types. Just now is the delivery mode, but there are two types. What the first type is micro credential that is from academic program, accredited academic program. That is the first type. The second type is the standalone micro credential. Standalone micro credential that means you develop a, a micro credential course that is not that has no parent or whatsoever with an existing academic program. So these are the two types of uh, micro-credentials that they explain in these guidelines to good practices micro-credential. Why it matters and why you have to know this is because if you develop a micro-credential course in which it originates from the parent academic program, the CLO of the micro-credential courses has to be exactly similar to the one to the parent to the one that you declare in your accredited program, academic program. However, for standalone micro-credential, or they call it as SAMC, this does not, uh, uh, this does not apply to SAMC. So you can do anything, you can develop anything. But recently, they have the second guideline, which is Guidelines to good practice, quality, verification of standalone micro credential. Okay. This second guideline talks about if you want to develop standalone micro credential. So we were thinking just now, okay, nobody will bother me if I want to develop a micro credential that is standalone. I don't have to think about how it uh, mirrors the academic program, the courses in the academic program, and whatnot. Uh, unfortunately, they come up with the second guideline. Okay. Uh, but this second guideline is about because there are many micro credential um, producers, I think, producers uh, in the market. You have small companies developing online courses, you have HRD, uh, HRD Corp developing online courses, you have so many entities developing online courses. And from MKA point of view, um, Students should, um, because they are the caretaker of the quality, right? So, from MQA point of view, um, students should be given a quality courses despite who are the owners of the courses. So, they come up with the second guideline to guide micro-credential um, producers, course producers, on how to um, design uh, a quality standalone micro credential. So, as I said just now, if I have um, a micro credential course on swimming, so, and my course on swimming does not belong to any academic program, so how do I design a quality swimming micro credential courses? Program, uh, micro credential courses? So, this is the concern of MQA. So, they have the good intention in which that you know they want to guide because maybe among us in higher education providers we are very familiar with uh, um, you know uh, aligning our assessment with our course and the outcome aligning the way we teach the content that we teach with our assessment our OBE constructive alignment and whatnot but maybe to other education providers this is not so familiar to them so that's why they have this second document to guide the standalone micro credential uh, producers or providers on how to design uh, a good uh, standalone micro credentials. And not only that, for example, I set up a company and my company um, develop um, or offer courses in the form of micro credential. And um, I want to promote to my future prospective students that after you go through my micro credential courses, you are able to apply for credit transfer in any higher education providers in, in Malaysia. So I want to use that as my selling point, and I want to, uh, and I can design micro credential courses that meets 
the university requirement equivalent to what is currently being offered at university. But I came from a private entity. So what I can do is that I build my micro-credential courses and I go to quality verification center. They call it as QVC. So I go to quality verification center and submit the courses that I have developed to this quality verification center. And this quality verification center is going to evaluate whether it is true or not that my micro-credential courses meets the quality requirement based, as I explained in this QVC document. So who are the quality verification center? So this can be any entity who pays the fee to MPA, of course. And they are being trained on how to evaluate quality micro-credential courses. Um, as far as I know, there are pilot universities being invited to be the quality verification center. So me, as a private entity, for example, let's say UM applies to be the quality verification center, it's a similar concept like Pusat Apel. Okay, so, uh, so I go to UM, quality verification center, I submit my micro-credential courses that I have developed from my company to UM quality verification center, and UM Quality Verification Center will appoint uh, assessors to evaluate my micro-credential courses, whether it meets the quality or not. And then I, my micro-credential courses will receive this, this MQA chalk. Okay, MQA symbol that it is, has been checked and it has met the, uh, the, the, the quality set by this guideline. So this is what the second guideline is about. It deals with stand-alone micro-credentials. But if you are offering micro-credentials uh, courses that is part of an uh, academic program, accredited academic program, then you should refer to the first guideline on good practices on how to design um, your micro-credentials. And it's not actually an issue because if you are developing micro-credential courses from an existing academic program, it should be mirror. It should mirror. It should be the same, the CLO should be the same, it should be the same, the SLT should be the same. The way you assess your students can be a little bit creative, but it has to be, it has to assess the same thing being assessed in the existing academic program being accredited. So that is the two type of micro-credential that we have in Malaysian context. And finally, to further promote flexibility, so MQA come up with this uh, Appel A and uh, Appel M guidelines. So this is to tell the students that after you have gone through uh, your micro credential courses, you can apply for credit transfer uh, based on uh, the guidelines that we have here. Uh, so the, 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 the guideline uh, details out on uh, what are the things that higher education institutions should prepare, what kind of checklist, and how you are going to assess your students who wants to apply for credit transfer through my credential. Is there more? Oh, there's more. So in Malaysia as well, um, we have the Excel um, playbook. Okay, so. Uh, this Excel playbook is maybe not very related to e-learning except for the POIS, for the POIS uh, curriculum framework. So Excel is uh, an acronym for Experiential Learning and Competency-Based Education Landscape. It actually tells higher education institutions or program owners about how can you design, how can you structure your program to be more transformative, I would say. So they propose four types of structure. So this is curriculum structure. It's not to be applied at course level, but it is to be applied at program level. So uh, you can design your program in such a way that it is research infused, it is industry infused, or is it in community based? Or finally, whether it is poised. Poised is personalized based. So I, I put up this uh, playbook here because I think it's relevant to e-learning because of the POIS structure. So this POIS curriculum structure, I think um, one example would be uh, Sarjana Muda Chitra in UKM. That would be an example of um, um, POIS curriculum structure in such a way that um, you learn 
uh, various domain, various learning domain in the first year of your study as a student. And then the second year, you, you can decide what is your preference. Do you like physics better? Do you like management better? Do you like accountancy better? Something like that. Uh, then you can decide to further focus on your preference towards the end of your year of study in the program. So that is how uh, you explain POIS. Um, so I think real, ideal, and care is not, um, um, I think it's not very difficult to explain. But POIS, that is how uh, this suggests if you want to design a personalized academic program, you can make use of the POIS structure in such a way that you give them freedom to learn everything and then they decide later what is their preference. And then they can end up graduating with the degree that they, that they want. Because sometimes um, the, the concern is that sometimes uh, students come in to the university, they do not know what is what they think they can do best, uh, what what would they like, unless they have been experiencing a little bit, okay, this is what management is, this is what science is. So that is the idea of POIS. And of course, we can offer POIS by combining micro-credential. We can design our academic program in such a way that the students can go through uh, a certain um, domain, learning domain, uh, in the form of micro-credential, so that they can have better idea what certain content is like, and then they can decide later what kind of degree that they want to uh, earn at the end of the day. So that is at the program level, which is Excel Playbook. And then we also have, of course, um, COPA ODL. Okay, uh, so this is also at program level in which it guides the higher education institution on how to offer op open and distance learning. Uh, and to offer open and distance learning program, um, your program have to be 80% of the courses has to be offered in open and distant mode, not online mode, in open and distant mode. However, <coughs> currently the way we see open and distance mode, it can be easily executed through online. So, but I just want to iterate that, you know, ODL does not mean online, it means open and distance learning, okay? But it, higher education institution can easily execute this kind of program through online mode, okay? So, um, so it tells the higher education institution on how can you design a program that is in open and distance learning mode, okay? Uh, so uh, it tells how can you design your learning materials to meet uh, the needs of uh, open and distance learners as well. Okay. Okay. And finally, I think uh, many of the guidelines that we saw before, uh, obviously, obviously, it is to support the Malaysia Education Blueprint 2015 to 2025 uh, from higher education. So, of course, this is our uh, the main book that we uh, we hold on to when we want to initiate any initiative in Malaysia, uh, especially related to e-learning. It is closely related to shift. Well, this as a shift, shift number nine and shift number two, if I'm not mistaken, lifelong learning and globalized online learning. And um, this is quite recent, Pelan Tindakan Pendidikan Tinggi Malaysia. Uh, now we are in the year of 2024 and uh, the Ministry of Higher Education was thinking how can we accelerate the progress uh, to achieve the things that we listed in the blueprint. So they come up with uh, Pelan Tindakan uh, to accelerate uh, the achievement of uh, the shifts that we promised in the blueprint. So that's the purpose of Pelan Tindakan. I think this is recently issued in 2020. It's actually published in 2023. Mm -hmm. um, so the Pelan Tindakan also, some of the initiative is related to e-learning, in, in which we plan to have a centralized e-learning center in Malaysia. Because if you see in Korea, they have um, a centralized e-learning unit. Uh, no, it's a centralized e-learning office that manages e-learning implementation uh, throughout the whole Korea, in which they tackle e-learning from preschool until elderly, online learning, which I think is very wonderful because they covers the whole spectrum of someone's life. That is actually a true life moment. And 
maybe to sum up, okay, I would say uh, the future of uh, e-learning uh, is actually uh, demand-based learning. I would say that is uh, the current trends that we are seeing uh, and because different people have different needs. And um, I would say lifelong learning. Um, and e-learning can certainly assist lifelong learning, which we can always use e-learning to promote preschool learning to elderly education. Okay. I think um, many of us, I think my mother, my mother myself is now 75 years old, in which I think we have better health services, in which I think maybe two or three years we have um, majority of our elders are educated elders. So I don't think, you know, learning is so much a limitation for our elders. Um, so we will have later on have uh, educated elders uh, in the nation. Okay? So we should make use of these elders as well. And why not provide them with lifelong learning opportunities. Um, and the future of e-learning as I see it should be allowing flexible entry and flexible exit. I think this is, I heard this from one of the speakers um, recently in a seminar that says that what would be, it would be wonderful if, for example, we offer a master's degree program in which when in the first year or the second year, you can choose to exit the education program, the, your academic program, and then you end that, you, and then you earn a diploma. Maybe, for example, I sign up for four years of learning. However, after two years, I feel like, okay, I think this is enough. I just need the things that I need. I have, I have, I have gone through the things that I want. I want to leave this program, but I do not want to leave empty-handed. I can earn a diploma at the end of my two years of learning. But if I continue to stay, maybe I stay until the fourth year, then I get my bachelor degree. So this is what it means by flexible entry and flexible exit. Okay, you can exit anytime you want from the academic program. Uh, you can enter anytime you want uh, in the academic program. I think entering an academic program at any point is uh, somehow made possible with uh, Appel, um, Appel Q. Uh, Appel Q allows you to enter uh, academic program without having um, uh, a diploma or a degree. Okay, if you don't have a diploma or degree, you can apply for PhD in fact. Uh, provided that you are, you have certain years of experience and you are being assessed and you complete all their checklists and performance tests with portfolio. Then you can enter a PhD program as well. So flexible entry somehow is happening, uh, but flexible exit is not yet happening, but it would be wonderful if, you know, if I can, uh, if I choose to spend only two years and then I, I get out from the system and I earn a diploma. And then um, the way I see uh, e-learning is like, um, maybe later on credit would be the education currency. In which, for example, because we can learn from any time and anywhere, from any courses, it would be wonderful if we can have an academic bank in which, you know, I have learned this course, this micro-credential course. This micro-credential course brings, um, uh, allows me to earn two credits. But where do I put my two credits? Is it meaningful to anyone? But it might be useful for me in the future. But So I can put this maybe two credits in my credit bank. And then later I want to use it for credit transfer for whatever purposes throughout my life. Then I can withdraw that credit so that credit is no longer can be used because I have used that to transfer credit for certain program. So it's like a bank concept where you withdraw money and then you deposit the money. But in terms of education context, that would be your uh, cost credit. Okay, If you offer your local credential, then it carries certain credits. And of course, um, I, the way I see e-learning in the future would be you can uh, stack your uh, micro-credential courses uh, to at the end of the day, uh, you earn a specific degree and that degree is very personalized to you because you are the one who design what courses to put in in your degree. That would be, I think, if we have more micro-credential courses in the future, this can certainly happen in our education system because we already allow credit transfer through uh, Michael Gudensha, which is Appel M, that I uh, show you just now. And my final key takeaways would be the future is now. Some of the things that I demonstrated and show you just now is already happening. And um, having e-learning, uh, we'll, we should promote uh, learning equality by providing a flexible learning ecosystem that is personalized to learners 
And we should, along the way, when we are designing our ODL program, when we are designing our micro-credential courses, or when we are teaching hybridly, we are teaching in a blended learning uh, mode, uh, we should leverage on advanced technologies. There are so many advanced technologies, and in fact, open source advanced technologies that we can leverage on um, to, uh, sure, to ensure that we support engaging uh, a demand-based education. I think that's all from me. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.